So we are here. I'm just going to give folks another minute or two to log in. We have a couple of people still navigating the waiting room, and I know um, Jim Agnew is going to be joining us by phone, and I don't see his phone number listed um, right now as a participant. So Jim, if you're here, yell out. Um, if not, we'll just give it another minute or two, and then we'll get started. I think we're going to get started. Um, you may notice that we are missing our chair this evening, Mike Tropiano. He is um, not with us this evening, but we have David Boyle, our vice chair, who will be chairing our meeting tonight. So be patient with us as we kind of navigate this in-person and remote meeting um, without the savviness of, of Michael, who is almost always here with us. So with that, David, it's all yours. Uh, I'd like to call the order the uh, Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. Pembroke School Committee meeting. Uh, everyone out there, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so that's our call to order. Uh, acknowledge and schedule visitors. I think we're okay there. Adjustments to the agenda, I believe we have one. Correct, we, we do. We have one adjustment to the agenda. Um, underneath communications, we have the MASC report of resolutions committee that um, Mike had spoken about at our last meeting and we shared the document with you following that meeting. I ask that we move that um, conversation to our 12-1 meeting so that Mike has an opportunity to participate. Um, for those of you on the committee that have taken a look at the attachment, there are several resolutions as part of the MASC newsletter. I know that Mike was interested in discussing um, one of them in particular, which was the one surrounding MCAS moratorium, but I do want to give him the opportunity um, to, to speak to that when he's able to join us. So if that's okay with you all. Um, I would like to suggest that we move that to your first meeting in December, which is December 1st. Do we have to vote on that or no? Is this being okay? Thank you. Approval of bill schedule. I know that's going around. I don't think it's finished yet. I know I uh, Consideration are we doing the minutes? Uh, school committee meeting minutes of October 27th, 2020. Uh, I will take a motion to approve those. So moved. Okay, thank you. Uh, moved by Susie, second by Suzanne. Um, I think right now it's just the three of us. So let me start with Sue. Yes. Susie? Yes. And myself is yes. Uh, we'll have three zero, Natalie. Jumping into the superintendent's report. Erin, you're on. Awesome. So there's just a couple of items that I wanted to update folks on. The first one is the updated health metrics. So I'm sure um, you all have heard in the news and, and seen various articles around the change in the stoplight metrics that we've um, discussed at length at this committee level. Um, Lisa Colletti, our health agent, is not joining us this evening. She will join us um, at the December 1st meeting. Um, at that meeting, I expect we'll have a very healthy discussion around local health data, what that means for winter sports, what that means for returning additional students to the classroom for more time. So she's not joining us this evening, but she is joining us on December 1st. Um, I do want to highlight a couple of pieces of the metric that have been updated. Um, so the original guidance from DESC around the stoplight metrics spoke to what type of designation um, each category lent itself to as far as a learning model. So when we first started talking about the stoplight metrics at the end of the summer, um, any community that was gray or unshaded or green would support an in a 100% in-person model, yellow would support a hybrid model, and red would support a 100% remote model. With this new metrics, 
the guidance from DESC has shifted to the fact that um, gray or unshaded, green and yellow would all support 100% in-person models and a red designation would be an indication of a school community to start looking at a hybrid model. So there is no um, designation that would um, lend itself to a 100% remote model. At the same time, how the data is collected for that stoplight metrics also changed um, on November 6th. So you'll remember that the target point that we discussed before was eight cases in um, a population of 100,000 was the trigger point to move from, from green to yellow or, or whatnot. That is now 10 cases in 100,000. What the state was seeing was that um, that case number was disproportionately um, challenging to smaller communities um, like ourselves. At the same time, they created two, um, three different buckets of population size. So under 10,000 has a set of metrics, 10 to 50,000 has a set of metrics, and then more than 50,000. Um, so again, using the size of the community as one of the factors also um, has shifted where folks are in the designation of green, yellow, unshaded, or red. Um, the other update to the metrics is to allow for um, taking into account communities where there is a uh, nursing home, a college, or a um, correctional facility. So there seems uh, there tends to be at times clusters of positive cases in those types of environments. The metrics now takes into account those those changes in those environments. Um, I think those are the main pieces of that. Um, with the new metrics, Pembroke itself was green last Thursday on the reporting date. Um, so in addition to the metrics, they have consistently been changing um, the date in which the weekly report is delivered. Um, so it is now delivered on Thursday evenings. Um, I would like to say that even in under the old metrics, Pembroke would have been green last week anyways, with 17 cases over the 14 days. That is a very low number for us. So we are um, you know, very happy and positive about that health data. We have had a um, similarly favorable week so far this week. There has been, um, those of you that get those daily emails, there was one day of a four, but there has been um, twos and threes. So, so we haven't seen any big six, sevens, and eights like we had seen in the, in the, the three weeks prior. Um, so I am expecting Pembroke to either remain green or shift to yellow, depending on what tomorrow and Thursday hold as far as case results. So those are the updated metrics. I'm happy to answer surface level questions. If you have them about that, Lisa is probably the best person to answer really in-depth questions. But if you have um, any kind of overarching questions around the, the changes in the health metrics, I'm happy to answer those. Sue has her hand raised. Go ahead, Sue. Um, if I read the Jesse rec or guidance, um, I believe at the very end it said uh, it's you know the colors and it supports whatever it supports, and then there was an if feasible. Is that correct? Right. Did I read that correctly? Yeah. Yes. And um, is that feasibility decision left up to the communities themselves, or is that going to be a Jesse additional guidance and what they consider consider feasible? Sure. So at this point, what is feasible is left up to local decision. Um, as you know, back in the beginning of school, when there was a handful of school districts that chose to start remotely, even though the health data did not support that type of remote start, DESE did step in and offer support to those communities. Um, at this point, it is still a local decision on what feasible, feasible is. So we know that the CDC <clears throat> guidance around spacing and the DESE guidance around spacing within classrooms are slightly different. Um, there's a couple of other instances where we've made a decision locally. Um, again, the governor's changed to his orders two weeks back. It does now require all students to wear masks. Um, pr um, previously, it was students in grades two and up. Again, our local metrics has been having all students wear masks. Um, so there are some uh, nuances to each individual community and how they're interpreting the health information and the guidance. Um, at this point, it is still left up to us to decide what is feasible. So um, we do have another conference call with Commissioner Riley Thursday afternoon. I don't expect him to, to come off of that. He has been a large proponent of allowing school districts to make the decisions within reason um, that make the most sense for their community. But if there is a community that is an outlier in the decision making, I would expect that the, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education would step in and offer support 
if necessary, to help you think about how to do it differently or, or, or whatnot, like they did back in the beginning of the school year with those remote districts. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ensure that that still stayed because of those, just as you pointed out, those varying guidelines of CDC, the state, DESE, you know, so thank you. <laughs> Susie, I can't hear you when you're... <laughs> okay, can, can you guys hear me now? If I, am I speaking loudly enough into the... Kind of, yes, no. I'm taking it off of mute, but I'm not... I can, how about that? No one ever asks me to speak louder. This is kind of unbelievable. <laughs> um, wait, can you hear me? Okay. I just... I know we're working to get to three weeks in green, correct, Aaron? Um, so and go ahead. If we did that, we would have the option to consider, but we're still working within the six foot CDC guidelines. So just to be clear, three weeks in the red changes Pembroke from a lower risk community to a higher risk community, which um, as you saw from what some of the, the pieces at the town have happened, that rolls back from phase three, step two, the community being phase three, step one. You need to be three weeks out of the red in order to go back to phase three, step two. You don't have to be green, you can be yellow, but it's three consecutive weeks out of, um, out of red. We have talked internally just around our comfort level administratively as well as with the local board of health around the six feet spacing. That is something that we would need some significant local health data to support. So whether that's three weeks in the green or four weeks in the green, um, I leave that up to, to you all to decide on, on what the, the right kind of tipping point is for that. But I do know that, um, as she said when she joined us the last time, Lisa is looking at multiple weeks in the green in order to support coming back off of that or feeling comfortable coming back off of that six foot spacing. Okay, and that's, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that and that we didn't translate that being three weeks out of the red would automatically throw us into everybody back and changing the spacing and everything. I just didn't want to, sometimes things get lost in translation, especially with this name. So I just wanted to make sure I was understanding. So thank you. That was it. Um, we do have one question in the chat box just around um, that. So can you speak to how the committee recognizes the disparity between DESE's shift in guidance and the governor's recent recommendation for communities, households, public places, and curfews? How will these two differing views impact decisions of the committee? Um, so before I let you all answer, I just want to kind of give a kind of brief overview. So that is the concept that we have been struggling with administratively, internally, not just here in Pembroke, across the South Shore and across the state. So I think all of us, our goal is to have students 100% in person, but it does seem as though sometimes the information that is shared is contradictory. So to come out and say we're putting X amount of constraints on everything outside of school, but bring all students back into school leaves us in a place where we're really trying to navigate what are the optimum safety precautions that we can put in place for students and staff to feel safe. So um, I think that is one of the reasons why you heard Lisa say that she's interested in, in multiple weeks of local health data supporting a shift for us. Um, at the same time, I think a lot of people have their eyes on what's gonna happen in the next couple of weeks. I know when we talked about um, Halloween, we were anticipating a potential uptick in cases following Halloween and, and Halloween gatherings. We're fortunate that we haven't seen that, but I know that Lisa um, and her folks are looking closely at what happens over um, the next holiday break, as well as the shift just in behavior to the sense where as the weather gets colder, um, people are not necessarily gathering outdoors, everything is coming more indoors, your opportunities to open windows and in introduce as much fresh air as possible become limited when you talk about the constraints on heating systems and whatnot. So um, I do I do know that that is what we have been struggling with. Again, we do have a um, administratively we do have a conference call with Commissioner Riley on Thursday. We are looking for specific guidance on what would support what new information is supporting this push for 100% in-person learning. If the overarching information that's shared publicly seems to be pushing every other facet of the, the state in a different direction. I don't know if you guys have something you want to add from a committee pers perspective on how you're thinking about what's happening with the with the governor versus DESC and, and how that affects how you're thinking about decisions moving forward. 
Well, I don't think you want to know what I'm personally thinking, but if you want to know what I'm thinking as I sit around this table, <laughs> um, that's exactly that person who asked that question. That's exactly what I was getting at. I was, you know, they're very different and I just wanted to ensure that we still had our choice and that Desi wasn't going to come down with whatever guidelines they're deciding to say and say you, you know, things like you must and you have to and things like that, that um, that's really was related to the thing to my question that we still have the latitude to try and understand why there is a disparity and what will ultimately be the best for everybody involved for education, for safety, for everything. I'll just follow up to what Suzanne said. That, you know, as a parent, I, I had the exact same question. I was confused to, to see certain things being put in place in the community, but then the flip side of us putting everybody back into school. And, and I agree with what Aaron's saying, and, and I know we've been fortunate enough to work um, continually with, with Lisa Colody and the Department of Health. And I think we do have to see the data. Um, also, we're moving into flu season, and, and it, flu season is very similar to you know, COVID symptoms in many ways. So, with that all happening, I'm not anxious to, to jump in without having data that really, you know, Firmly supports it. I, I I feel like you're in the gray zone, and and I want to I want something that's adamant one way or another. You know, if it doesn't support it, or if it clearly does support it. And, and right now, I feel like we're kind of in the gray. So, um, I think it's a valid question. I think having the, the help that we have from from the town, with Lisa giving us as much as she does, and she's speaking to us on such a routine basis, I, I think we're in a wait and see right now. Take a question from the audience. Yep. So we have someone in the audience that's going to ask a question. I'll repeat the question because they're they're probably not going to be able to hear you on this. You sound like you, have, you seem like you have a loud voice, but I'm a. At six feet of spacing. Yes. Right, but we brought back pre K K and one at six okay, so feet of spacing. Now we're going in the right direction into the green, mm -hmm. and now you want to just stop it. I mean, honestly, you don't have an elementary school kid. David doesn't. I think that this committee, you know, you probably got the phone calls and stuff. You know, your plan was two weeks. Let's go to the next thing and move it on. The data is there that says schools aren't breaking out in huge populations. That's why the state's going one way. They're not closing the bars at 9.30 for an elementary school kid or a high school kid. It's adults that are going out there that are being careless. It's not our elementary school kids that are out there, okay? No one on these committees has a kid in elementary school. I do, other parents do. You know, they should have that option. They want to send their kids back. I mean, they're elected to do what your constituents want what's best for these kids. And these kids, I don't care. I mean, I've seen in the last two weeks, the school that my kids are getting at home, it, it's pathetic. And it's horrible. It's not the teacher's fault. It's 15 minutes of, of you know, an eight-year-old eight running around, then 10 minutes of class, a snack break. Something's got to get. We should be trying. If you guys had this in the beginning of the year and said, let's send all the kids back, and you found out that during the whole, you would go for three months, and you find out you've had nine cases in the school. You would have been like, I hope this is back. You know, it's time for action. Put the superintendent's plan into action. So you make a decision and you give it a week. So by the end of next week, tonight you should be making the decision, say, let's get the ball rolling. And by next week, we're in the green again. We should be moving to get those kids back. At this rate, those kids ain't going to be back. What, what do you think? A couple weeks ago, the superintendent said, the kids are gonna to go to school, what, 48 days at this rate? Give or take, four days a month times 10 months? I don't think I gave a number, so but. Give, <laughs> so it doesn't take, you know, MIT scientists to figure out four days a month, or six days a month, that's what they're going to They're not getting an education. I mean, myself, I knew every day I needed in school. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? We need to get these kids back. And I think that it's your responsibility mm -hmm. to do that. And I think that the superintendent had a great plan. Get it moving forward. So I'm going to repeat it for the folks that are at home that didn't hear. Um, it is Mr. Kelly, and he did join us a couple weeks ago um, when school committee voted to bring back pre-K, K, and 1. And the question and, and more concern is around what is the timeline and when are we moving on the rest of the grades? Um, I think it's important to point out that we moved on pre-K, K, and 1 because we were able to maintain the six feet of space. We do not have the ability to do that with other grades. I know for myself and for, for our local health agent, Lisa Cullity, in order to move off of the six feet, we're gonna need more than one week in the, red, in the green to make that decision. At the same time, one of the major constraints on bringing back additional grades is transportation. So without the transportation guidance, which now requires three feet of spacing on the buses, which is one student at the window, next, uh, next row, one student at the aisle, we're not able to bring back more students with the fleet of buses that we have. Um, in conversations at the state level with transportation vendors, it takes up to 90 days for them to add a, a bus to a fleet because they have to go out, they have to bid it, they have to procure it, and they have to lease it. Um, for us, I know we have the conversation around there's a lot of parents. Again, I am a mother of an elementary age student. And I would happily drive my kid to school if they could go every day, and I know there are a lot of parents that feel that way. Um, we would need to really hammer out who's riding the bus and who's not riding the bus. Right now, we plan for students that have bus passes. We would have to go back and ask everybody to turn in their bus pass and then reissue passes only to the students that are needing the transportation. So um, I, I don't think it's impossible. I do think we need some things at the state level to support the decision to bring more kids back if we're gonna come off of the six feet of spacing. Again, one week in the green isn't necessarily that. Um, we are in an amazing place with our health data in the schools. As you said, we've had 13 cases in the 10th week of school. Um, we have one active case right now. There's been very few times in the 13 weeks where we've had more than one or two at the same time. Um, so we do have really great school data, which I think really speaks to the work that's happened in our school buildings that our custodians are doing, that you know, at the middle school, our students wipe their own desk. At the high school, the students wipe their own desk. So really, the work that's happening here and, and you know, to hastily jump into bringing kids back at less than six feet of space, I, I think would, again, it is the call of the, the school committee, but I think when I spoke about my plan, it was about bringing kids back as safely as we can. And I know that six feet of space is, is what we deem to be quote unquote safe right now. Um, and that's my comfort level and that of, of the health agent. And I'm not sure that we have enough local data to say that five and a half feet of space is enough spacing, but I'm happy to hear what you all as the committee have to say. Again, you know, there is a, a five phase plan that I've, I've given to you and shared multiple times and I'm happy to, to talk more about each of those phases and the, and the timing of those phases as well. Um, tomorrow would be two weeks after phase one started. So we brought back um, pre-K, K and one on November 4th. Um, so the original timing in the plan was to reevaluate every two weeks. So it would be tomorrow is the two week point for that grade, grade span. Even any comments? I'm, I'm sorry, what, I, I can't hear you, David. I'm sorry, any comments? Or? Um, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna repeat myself, so sorry everybody for having to listen to me a second, even a third time, but you know, we do have a plan. Um, it is the phased approach. And up until now, you know, we, we were moving ahead with that, you know, and then, mm, Brakes got put on because suddenly we're a red community. You know, now the brakes are coming off and we're, you know, gonna keep going on that plan. But I mean, we do have a plan. I, I feel like some people think we don't and we're just kind of making decisions as we go every week, but there is a phased plan and there were guidelines that Erin pretty much reiterated and they were not, they're, they're hers and ours. You know, we're, we're teaming this, you know, and, and developing those um, to move forward, but there's certain things that have to happen. Um, and those haven't happened yet. Um, and maybe they are next week. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, I've said this since I think July, you know, we know what we know today and we don't know what we're going to know tomorrow. Um, we're in uncharted territory. We're in uncharted waters. You know, the whole world is in this space. You know, it's not just 
Pembroke, <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, we're, we're, I feel really comfortable. I think we've navigated it in a really good way. Um, the community has done a great job. The administration, the teachers, the kids, you know, it's, it's really awesome. You know, you used that word earlier, Erin, awesome. We're, we're in an awesome place and, and we are, um, and we want to stay there. And so we have a plan and the numbers are changing, the colors and the numbers are changing. So now we can kind of start looking at that plan. Um, but again, it's really hard to, to go forward when there's conflicting data out there. And again, I'm, I'm repeating myself, so I'll stop now. Nobody needs to listen to me talk anymore. <laughs> I, I think you make very, very valid points. And uh, although I don't currently have an elementary student, I, I, I did. I had two. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like. Well, and we're in a pandemic. You've, so you've never had all your kids at home have parents that have to give up learning or something. Like that. But don't say you did. You went to work and you have kids like to do. Go back and forth with you on that because you don't know what I've done either because I haven't always lived here and I haven't always had the same. We, we don't have the same experiences and that doesn't matter. Um, but there's so many layers to this. But I'm with you. I want my anxiety riddled daughter who's home full remote back in this building as soon as I can get her back in. You're talking 90 days ago. So now the kids at this rate, they're not going back. The next phase won't start till January which is ridiculous. So why do we publish this plan? This is kind of like your survey of what, you, what the parents wanted of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You guys did your own Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Friday. So I mean, well, I think we spoke to some of that. It, and it's, it's hard because I, I do understand that it's frustrating for everyone. But everything, the planning has to start sometimes months in advance. You know what? Maybe you should have thought about the bus issues Maybe in September. So right now, your plan was to just let it go. Let the kids go. I mean, so we kids, did have conversations about our the safety is failing these kids. And that's we had time. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm, and I, I'm sorry that you're frustrated, and, and my heart aches for every family and family to be there. But the, there's so many layers to the planning, including the staffing and their concerns, as, as well as the busing. All of this has been talked about. We were on our way, as Suzanne said, and, and I wish we could flip the switch quickly. Um, but we're getting good. Get the going. You've got to get it powered up and moving forward. At this point, you're getting a lot of stagnant. This is not even a progression to do that, which is unfortunate. The worst action is what kind of action? Is no action. Right, and so I'm just going to hop in and, and respectfully disagree that we have not been doing anything. So again, we, I, I have shared with the school committee exactly how much space is in every single classroom, exactly how many square feet, exactly what the foot and inch we can get to as far as spacing goes. We do not have any more places where we can go to six feet. But again, I know and you know the science between whether it's three feet or whether it's six feet, I'm not sure there is any science that supports one way or the other. But the, the, the societal norm right now is six feet. There's not one place in Massachusetts where you go where they're saying be less than six feet apart. So until something like that piece changes and our health data still is favorable, it's very difficult for me to say to the staff that works here, to the families that are nervous. I know there's a lot of families that want their students to come back. But when we survey folks, unfortunately, the way it comes back is always a third, a third, and a third. A third is happy with what we're doing. A third wishes we would do more, and a third wishes that we'd do less. So there are still families in this community that are nervous about bringing kids back four days in person. Right, and so until I can say to them with confidence that five and a half feet is enough space for your kid to be as safe as they were at six feet of space, which we're not there yet. I, you know, one week in the green is great, and I'll take this week, and I'll take next week, and I'll take the week after that. If we're still green two weeks from today, it's a different conversation for myself and for the, the health agent to start to talk about. But again, it's a conversation that still needs to be broached with families and with staff. So, you know, changing the norms and changing the working conditions for folks are, are larger conversations than just the overarching goal of bringing all students back. We do have the ability at five feet of space to bring every elementary student back. Again, we are going to have some transportation concerns. 
we have started to work with first student who is our bus provider and who is really the only provider on the South Shore when we bid our buses. And you know, we have two buses here that we own, PM1 and PM2, that we use for athletic transportation. We've already thought about how to route those buses into the rotation to get more kids back to school. So all of that work is happening behind the scenes. It may not necessarily feel as though we're moving fast enough, but I think that there is a mistake in moving too fast. I have been, there has been at least seven community, local communities that reached out to me specifically after we brought back pre-K, K, and one to wanted, wanting to know how we did it, why we're doing it, what is our thought process, what are we doing next? So we are one of the only communities that is at least even moving, which I know isn't at a, at a speed that is fast enough for everybody, but we are moving. There are some communities that haven't even looked at what it's like to bring kids back. We're talking about presenting plans in mid-January for what it looks like to bring kids back. So we are moving, we are working on it, but I think the, the piece that we are stuck at right here is the six feet. And until something changes societally about six feet, it's going to be a very difficult sell to our teachers and to our families that are nervous about the, the spacing in classrooms to say that it's safe at less than six feet. Is, is three weeks of green enough to, to shift that tide? I hope so. I feel, I feel confident in that metrics. I know Lisa Culley feels confident in that conversation as a, as a point as well, but we're not there yet. Um, I was going to put my, there we go. Oh. Am I off? You're muted. <laughs> there we go. Back, but sorry. Um, certainly with the concerns and, you know, I've known you guys for a long time and I know people with children. I look at this and, and I, I take a little bit of offense. You know, Scott, said the committee's kind of doing nothing. We have a plan. It's not a perfect plan. There's never been a playbook for this. Um, we've started moving in the right direction. We've got a couple of hangups, you know, whether it's the six feet, whether it's transportation, which is everything. And believe me, I know it's frustrating. Like I said, I don't have an elementary school, but you know, certainly have two kids in the system. Um, I think like everything else, we're people bear with us. We're doing the best we can. I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating for everybody. It, it's, it's, yeah. You don't think that all these kids are out in our neighborhoods every day playing? Oh, I went to the Y today. There's 200 kids in the gym there. Yeah, no. They're doing remote learning. Like, that's what these other kids are. I, I, was, not an issue. I was in Salem today watching little kids walking, holding hands. We're arguing over the whole thing. But, but, but it's all just an absolute. You're never going to be able to tell the cameras that every kid. We tell the kid to walk outside here and get hit by a school bus. Yeah. And you, know, I, you, can't, you, can't, you just can't basically plan for everything. We, we can't, but as I said, in going by, yeah, no, and again, I, I don't want to sound crazy, but thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next item, which is elementary space and breakdown. We kind of um, discussed that. Enough. So I, I just will reiterate that I shared with you all just the spacing by classroom by building. Um, it shows you exactly how many square feet of space, usable space there is for student desks in a classroom. I'm happy to um, share those spreadsheets on on the website as well when we post the video. It's the spreadsheets are hard to share on my screen as they're you know multi cell long and, and really print on legal size paper, but I'm happy to put those up for people to see. You can see the exact spacing in our classrooms. When I say what space is available for student desks, I just want to preface that with when we're looking at a classroom under DESC guidance, it's really minimal furniture. It is really a teacher workstation and desks. Those of you that have elementary age students or even upper secondary students know that a lot more goes into a classroom than just teacher and, a, and student desks. Um, but the spacing that I gave you shows how much room is for student desks with the teacher having the six feet of space across the front of the classroom. So the space for their desk as well as the ability to instruct at the board um, as, as, as that works in the classroom. Um, I want to point out that that leaves a very narrow walkway to the sinks for students. So we're, you know, there's mandatory hand washing breaks within our classrooms. Um, believe it or not, even though we're sitting in rows and desks, rows of desks facing one direction, students still get up to sharpen their pencil. So there's not a lot of room to move within the classroom 
like that. At the same time, a lot of our elementary teachers are working in rooms where the projector is located on a cart as opposed to being suspended from the ceiling. So in those classrooms, once you put the projector in the middle of the room so it can project onto the whiteboard, it does also cut into the spacing that we have for students. So can we figure it out at, I think if you look at the spreadsheet, I highlighted in yellow kind of the spacing that works everywhere. Can we figure it out most places at five and a half feet of space? Absolutely. If we had five feet of space between students, would there be more walking space? Would there be um, more ability for the teacher to have an additional file cabinet? Absolutely. But again, the conversation around when, when we pull the trigger to go from six feet to less than six feet of spacing is something that I wouldn't bring to you unless I was supporting it professionally. And I know that Lisa Colletti is not going to bring it to you until the health data in this town supports that. And again, one week in green is not enough health data to even begin the conversation on bringing students back at less than six feet of space. The other set of spreadsheets that I shared with you um, does show the transportation numbers. So I know there's um, a handful of comments in the box just around folks that drive their, their children to school and do see that some of the buses are quote unquote empty or are very sparsely populated. Um, so the maximum capacity on the buses right now is 23 to 25, depending on whether it's a, um, a 76 or an 84 passenger bus. We do have buses that are running with 23 or 25 students on them. We also have some buses that have 10 students on them. So again, we do have um, routes for all of the buses for students that every student that has a bus pass, not every student takes the bus home to and from school every day. We do have some parents that drive on Tuesday, but they take the bus home on Thursday. Um, so all of those students are accounted for when we're talking about the logistics associated um, with transportation. Again, if, if we're getting to the point where the only piece that's, that's keeping us from bringing back more students is transportation, then absolutely the work that we've been doing behind the scenes will become public work that we'll start talking about at this level as far as how can we best utilize our buses? How can we best utilize our staff that's able to drive buses? How can we work with our vendor for students to add more routes? How can we get more tiers on our buses? That is absolutely conversations that are happening behind the scenes and we're starting to plan those pieces out. But at this point, the, the crux of the conversation is around that six feet of space and, and that's still where we're at administratively as well as um, from a, a local board of health perspective. So again, I will share those when um, Sharon posts the video, I'll, I'll share the, the spreadsheet so that folks can at home can see them as well. Unless, um, I don't know if any of you have questions about the spreadsheets um, that I shared as well. Well, I, I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, you know, about you, you have to plan for all the bus passes that are out there, although we know pretty clearly that those bus passes aren't being used consistently to and from school. But if somebody has been given a bus pass, they have a spot a seat on the bus, so to speak. Um, and we have to make that available. So unless we do something like you touched on earlier and really kind of, okay, let's start all over. If you're going to, if you're going to use it, take it. If you're not going to use it, don't take it. So we can have some more accurate numbers. But, you know, I understand families, you know, <laughs> yeah, but I might need it. You know, I, I get that. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough one, you know, on the, on the busing piece. It's, it's, it's hard to navigate, but you know, the numbers, I'm looking at the charts and yeah, those, those are some big numbers. Those, some of those numbers are well beyond 25. So, um, you know, we'd have to be doing a bit of work to get there. Just following up, um, Suzanne, one of the comments I would make is I've said to someone, uh, um, you know, we, we can't double sell a ticket for lack of a better term, you know, just because we only have 10 kids on a bus, but you know, 23 or 24 signed up, we can't all of a sudden say, well, we'll sell 14 more spaces on that bus and hope those kids don't show. And that's something a lot of people have to be aware of. Um, I, I, I hear it every day from parents who said, oh, that bus was empty. It would drove by my house and I didn't see any kids on it. And you know, it, it's a fact of life. I said, my kids, Take the bus, don't take the bus, depending on the day, the weather, there's a million different factors. So you can certainly sympathize. 
in the chat box, there's just a couple of questions around things that we've kind of already hit on. Um, again, if, if transportation is the only logistic that we're still trying to figure out, absolutely, I'd be willing to, to make a recommendation to the committee that we go back to families and, and have them kind of redo the bus pass and, and transportation conversation and only have families that absolutely need a pass be issued a pass. I definitely think that's something that we can turn around fairly quickly for folks if that's the, the last piece that we're still trying to figure out. Um, there's a couple of questions in here on why why are we talking about six feet when CDC is saying that three feet is far enough? So it's the, the um, uh, Department of Pediatrics that is saying three feet of spacing is enough spacing for students, but at the same time, the, the societal norm is, is six feet of spacing. So if you look at the DEFC guidance, it's saying three feet is the minimum and striving for six feet. So in, as, as we've approached this work over the latter part of the summer and into this fall, we have always strived for the six feet of spacing again and, and the local health data would need to support us having a conversation other than that. So again, that conversation isn't a, a non-starter for us. I just think it's, it's a conversation that needs a little bit more local health data to support um, facilitating the conversation with, with our Board of Health agent as well as with our staff and with our families that are nervous. Um, I do not know if we would have had three weeks under the new three weeks of red under the new metrics. I do know that two of those three weeks we are significantly higher than the 10 per 100,000. So my my estimation, I, I can go back and, and do the math if it's helpful for folks, is that the the first week I don't think we would have been red, but the latter two weeks we still would have been red. So again, two weeks in the red is cause for some pause for us here. Um, as far as whether you know that would be a catalyst for a conversation on, on moving to, to more in-person at less feet of space. So at least two of those three weeks would definitely be read. Um, and I can ask Lisa to talk a little bit about that when she joins us on December 1st. Um, the other thing I wanted to update you on as far as returning to learn, and if you just bear with me for one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we have been talking about um, the surveys that we've done with families around returning to learn and the, and the mode in which their students are, are learning with us, as well as, um, though, though Mike isn't here, he has asked several times for us to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing to bring students, some of our higher needs students that are not necessarily um, successful on the remote platform back in person more days per week. So this data that I'm about to share with you reflects the conversations that we've had with students and families through today. So at Bryantville, you, you can see there we have eight students that were in cohort A or B that are now joining us four days a week in cohort C. So again, this is data for grades two through six because we do have our pre-K, K, and one students all with us four days a week. So we have eight students at Bryantville that have shifted um, from cohort A or B, the two day a week model, to the four, um, sorry, that one, to the four day a week model. At Habamuk, we have three students. And at North Pembroke, we have six students. So that is 17 elementary students shifting to cohort C. Um, at the middle school, we have 12 students, three, three seventh graders, um, seven eighth graders, and two more that we're still um, working with families on to move from the two day a week model to the four day a week model, and at the high school, seven students. Um, so this was internal conversations that, um, that mostly happened with our special ed team chairs. Our, our um, you hear us refer to them as acronyms: SST, AST, IST. All of the student support teams that occur in each of our buildings around students that we really needed to engage better with. Um, and so that's these were really school-driven conversations. So us reaching out to families and saying, you know, it looks as though we could service your child better in this model. The second set of numbers is around the survey that we did out to families, asking them after the initial six weeks, are they interested in changing their students' learning model? Um, so again, there's kind of two shifts here, cohort D, which is our full remote students that were looking to rejoin us in person, as well as students that were joining us in person that are now looking to be 100% remote. So this first slide shows you the number of students by building and grade that were in our full remote model that are now um, joining us in person. So. At Bryantville, we have six students. At Habermock, four. North Pembroke has two. PCMS has eight. And the PHS has seven students that were um, previously learning 100% remotely. So that's 27 students that are joining us now in person, either in cohort A, B, or C, depending upon their student need and the spacing. Um, and we, again, obviously the reverse is true. We have a, a handful of families that are looking to 
um, transition from our in-person model to our remote model. You can see from the data there, it's, there's very, very little movement at the elementary level to cohort D. So two students at Bryantville, one at Habermock and one at North. We do have two students at the middle school, um, but the greatest number of students looking to transition to the full remote model um, does occur at the high school with 14 students. So overall, the numbers going out and coming in just about wash out when we talk about um, how many of our students district-wide are accessing the remote model. We're still just under 10% of our students, so 90% in our hybrid model and 10% in our 100% remote model. Um, we can continue to update you all on this if there's any kind of sweeping changes. I know there are still a handful of families that we're working with and, and you know, trying to engage with them and their students to come back in more in person. So if there's any update to this, I can share it at the December 1st meeting as well. I don't know if any of you have any questions about that one. Suzanne, any questions? No, you presented it very clearly. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the thing I, I always wonder is, you know, if we're bringing everybody, I, I, I wonder if, if we said, okay, we're going to bring everybody back five days a week, how many people would jump on board for that? You know, that's like another option. I mean, you were looking between hybrid and remote. Those are two things. But if we're going to go full in, what do people feel about that? I mean, I'm not saying we're going to do that, but I'm just saying it, it, it's, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, so I think we just have to be thoughtful of that, that the choices that people have now, they're making these decisions based on the choices they have now. If they had other choices, what might those decisions be? We might, we might be surprised. I don't know. But thank you, that was very clear. No, I think that was good, thank you, Aaron. Yep. There's just one question in the chat box. If school isn't fully in person by the end of the semester, will the option to switch cohorts be available? So again, we have um, said from the beginning that we would engage with families about every six weeks to see if they're looking to shift their student's learning model, understanding that you don't have to wait six weeks if something in your life medically or, or whatever changes and you're needing to shift, please reach out to your, your, um, your home school, whether it's uh, one of our elementary schools, the middle school or the high school, and we will accommodate families as quickly as we can, but we will do another kind of global reach out to families at, uh, after another six weeks. So that'll take us, I'm pretty close to the end of the semester mark um, at the secondary level. So there's just a question around, could they switch at the semester point if they chose? Absolutely. Um, so the next item under my report is a winter sports update. So I again, I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about winter sports. And um, before I do that, I do want to talk about um, the great fortune that our teams have had in the Patriot Cup. So those of you that have been following our sports know that um, in lieu of a, a tournament, an MIA tournament, the Patriot League has um, been putting on a Patriot Cup by sport where just the teams within the, the same conference are playing each other. So our boys soccer team is playing in the finals Thursday night here at Pembroke High School. Um, so I just want to talk about a couple of things associated with that. First, I know that there's a lot of folks that have seen the, the wicked local photo that's posted of our um, young men really celebrating their um, semifinal win just the other day. And, and some of the photos, not all of the students have their mask pulled up over their nose. Um, I do want um, families to know that we have addressed that both with the coach and the team, as well as our athletic director is um, on point to, to be managing that as we move into Thursday's game. At the same time, I want to talk about spectators at Thursday's game. Um, so you are um, all familiar at the committee level with our spectator policy. So it's the two lanyards per um, student athlete. We did have a substantial number of students lining the fence outside of the stands at the last game. Again, it is very difficult for us to police the six feet of spacing when you're not within the confines of, of the, the complex. So I know that Principal Talbot was gonna share with students um, that his expectation is that students are not lining up along that fence there um, and that only those that have the lanyard to um, come to the game are those that are being admitted to the game. So we are excited for our boys for Thursday night, but there are obviously some, some logistical pieces that we are still responsible um, for managing as well. So as far as winter sports, when we talked at our last meeting, 
um, around the start of winter sports. So tentatively winter sports were slated to begin um, by November 30th. So the Patriot League took a vote to push that date off until December 10th. At our last meeting, I talked around what needed to happen in order for sports to start around November 30th, and it was needing to get the sport-specific modifications from the individual sport committees at the MIAA prior to November 9th. So we have not received those yet, which I think it is um, a testament to the reason why Patriot League has pushed off the start of spring sports. So you can see here on the timeline what the actual meeting dates are for those committees. So Yesterday, the Sports Medicine Committee met. Tomorrow, the MIA COVID Task Force Committee meets. And by Friday, the Board of Directors will be meeting to finalize the recommendations for committees, so um, from the committee. So I will share, again, with our committee those, those details as soon as we have them in anticipation of our December 1st meeting. Um, but I don't think we're going to be able to have a conversation around what the sport-specific modifications look like until December 1st. I think there was a glimpse of hope that we might have our hands on some of them by this evening, but we do not um, have them at this point. Um, again, there's also some other nuances to pushing the start date in the Patriot League from November 30th to December 10th. You can see there, um, it allows us the opportunity to see the guidelines. It allows coaches to have their parent meetings once we see what the specific sport modifications are, as well as it does create a buffer between um, any Thanksgiving uptick in numbers that we're going to see in the actual start of sports. Um, just to kind of go over what we have for winter sports here. So um, traditionally, indoor track is a winter sport that has been pushed to fall two. So fall two is that um, kind of in the middle season where football and fall cheer find themselves. So that February timeline. Um, cheerleading, again, uh, competitive cheer has been pushed to fall two or potentially spring. So again, there's two seasons of cheer, fall and winter. Um, at this point, the fall cheer has been pushed to fall two, and there is a proposal on the table to push winter cheer along as well. Wrestling has been pushed to the spring. At this point, that is just a recommendation. We are still waiting on approval um, at the MIA level. So our winter sports this year would be um, swimming, gymnastics, boys and girls ice hockey, and boys and girls basketball. So we're just waiting on the sport specific modifications for those. We do have our registration open our winter sports registration open in power school um, for those families that are interested to get in and get registered even before knowing what the sports specific modifications are. Um, just to reiterate our spectator policy, so there's a bit of a change from the indoor, uh, from the outdoor policy to the indoor policy. So for our outdoor um, contest, you heard me say it was two lanyards per student athlete. Um, at the same time, there is various uh, away matches where away spectators are um, able to participate as well. Pembroke is not one of the communities that was allowing away spectators just based off of the size of our, our stands and our complex. Um, the EEA has given out um, recommendations for the spectator policy for winter sports. So again, in addition to the two adults per student athlete, they're now allowing siblings, um, so long as the capacity doesn't exceed 50%. Um, right now for outdoor contests, we are a phase three, step one community, so limited to 50 students. Um, and those communities that continue to stay in the green and the yellow and are in phase three, step two, are able to have up to 100 students, 100 people attend the contest. What about the hockey ones? Do they have to comply with how that works? Right, so the indoor spaces like the hockey rinks or um, the gymnastics center or we use um, the Kingsbury Club for our swim team would, would need to comply with these regulations. Um, these regulations are actually a, a little bit more lenient than the, the governor's um, guidance for indoor spaces. Again, schools do have an exemption from that guidance, so they would be going by these, these parameters here. Any question? I have three. Three questions, Sue, okay. So first of all, um, you addressed how we are dealing with the uh, uh, improper use of the face mask by our athletes. Is the Patriot League dealing with it on a league-wide basis? Because I saw a lot more than just Pembroke students without the proper mask faces on. So, you know, we can all be doing it in our own little space, but is the league going to take this on as a whole in some way, shape, or form? And 
try to enforce it as best they can. That's probably more of a comment than a question. <laughs> um, my second is uh, the numbers. I think you had 155. Does that field and are those enough students in each of the sports to field teams? Because on hockey, you kind of need enough people on the ice to play. <laughs> Um, does that, are those numbers looking good for all those sports or is, is, is the tally not in yet? Um, so I think that's still a, a rolling number right now. There's, again, we haven't scheduled a winter sports night for folks. Coaches haven't kind of started that process with teams yet. Um, you know, I, I would expect we will have enough to field the teams that we generally field. I will remind folks that our hockey numbers tend to kind of go in cycles. I know that last year was a pretty light number um, for JV boys hockey. So I'm, I'm not sure what that number looks like. I'm going into to this winter, but again, as soon as we have a, we're a little bit closer to the date and have a better idea, I will share that information with folks. And my last question, and I guess this is probably more of a comment also, is that, you know, these indoor sports, um, albeit they're not there for the length of a school day, I mean, you know, we've pretty clearly been, you know, very thoughtful about our ventilation systems and our air movement and our airflow and now we're having you know our spectators and our athletes go into facilities and do we do we know if those facilities are taking on those same types of measures um, for airflow and movement of air um, and i guess the other thing is is i just would want people to know that that if they're they're not mandated or kind of you know, governed by any, but not mandated, governed by anybody, they need to be, understand that, that you may be walking into a facility, even though it's a school-based activity, it's in a facility that may or may not have the same type of guys that our schools have, that we've put in place in our schools. So I, I, it's more of a comment and just kind of a, like, a, just everybody beware, you know, Right. I'll also remind you that our, you know, volleyball is a fall sport and our girls have been playing in gyms in Patriot League schools for the, for the fall. And so not everybody has the same um, level of ventilation. Again, a lot of schools on the South Shore, a lot of high schools are newer than our high school here in Pembroke. So uh, a lot of folks have even a better ventilation system that we have here. But any school that is open and in operation meets the guidelines for proper airflow in a school building. So I don't want to, to scare anybody into thinking that you know, X high school isn't safe for occupancy. So every building that is open meets the requirement for airflow in an educational institution. But again, there are varying levels of, of what people are, are doing as far as, you know, we have the UV sanitation lights involved, um, installed in the ductwork here. Not everybody has that level um, of, of um, sanitation. You know, the, the guidance for most districts is to leave the dampers on the rooftop units open. Almost every district is, is doing that. But again, there is some variability within um, different ventilation systems. At the same time, in the conversations that I've had with um, Brian Phillips, our new athletic director, it is not our intent right now to allow outside spectators into our building. So just the athletes, the student athletes and their families, similar to our spectator policy for the fall. So our buildings are really closed to the public at this point. So it seems to be counterintuitive to be inviting away fans from other towns that could have much different health data than we have into our spaces. So at this point, our, our, we're not planning on allowing outside spectators. Um, at the same time, any of the indoor matches, again, are, um, you know, don't, don't usually exceed the two to three hour range. Uh, I know, you know, having had the opportunity, many of us to hear Lisa speak at length um, since March through now, there is kind of a window of time when you're talking about air and recirculated air. So I feel very confident in our student athletes um, attending um, contests at every one of the, the Patriot League um, high schools, as well as the indoor facilities that we use, whether it be Habermas Ice Arena, Kingsbury Club, or the Gymnastics Center. So, um, okay, thank you for clarifying that. I, I guess I really, in winter, I was really thinking about those third party venues, not other schools. So thank you for, I wasn't questioning other schools, I was questioning those third party venues. And I apologize, I should have made that comment slash question a little bit more clear. Um, I'm just familiar with those two sports and I know they, they don't happen in schools. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just as we talked about the pushing it out to December 10th, will that impact the um, 
kind of that interim sport where we're pushing, we originally had football and things scheduled. Is there going to be any, because when did these winter sports end? Nope. So the MIA still governs when the season ends. So the season will still end before that February 20, yeah, I think it's 21st date for that um, fall two season to begin. So the ending date of winter sports will still remain the same and that's set by the MIA. MIAA, the start date is, is just what is shifting. So those, as it's laid out on the calendar, fall two or that in between um, season season will still happen in February. And they'll still be able to compete at least the number of, of yeah. know, interactions with other schools and, yeah. and, and satisfy a, a, a true season. Right. So again, the fall season we had here was a little bit shorter as far as number of contests um, than previous years. I'd expect a similar kind of setup for um, the winter sports as well. Okay. I just was, I just wanted to make sure we didn't have too big of an overlap kind of tying into what Suzanne said with the number of athletes and recognizing a lot of people who play multiple sports. So right. thank you. Well, I think by taking away the playoffs, you know, pretty much MIA is eliminating all of that stuff. Um, so it's going to allow us, you know, you, you don't lose that two or three weeks at the end of the season and get paid for it. So I think that uh, kind of takes care of itself. Um, there's a couple of questions. So it ends with a question mark, but sometimes it's a comment um, in the chat box. So I'm happy to answer a few of them. I don't obviously know all of the answers as we don't have all of the sport specific information. Um, so there's just a question. There's a couple of questions on why basketball is allowed to participate even though there's contact, but with indoor track that there isn't. Um, my understanding around indoor track is a facility-based reason that it's moving to the to the fall two um, season. I, I think I, I think Mike might have even spoken about it in, in a public setting in a public meeting a few weeks back. Um, really, the only game in town for indoor track is the Reggie Lewis um, Center, and right now they're not open to outside groups um, to be used. Even some of the local colleges like Wheaton have really. Um, really strict guidelines on who they're allowing in to use their facility. So I, I do believe it's a resource issue with indoor track, not a contact versus non-contact sport. Um, I do not know um, what whether or what date track team would be allowed to have captain's practices. I will have um, Brian Phillips who will be joining us on December 1st when we have all of our um, athletic information. I will have him prep to answer that question. Um, this is an interesting one. If a senior who typically has played sports in the past decides not to play a sport this year, is there a waiver available for the gym requirement? So again, that's a, a student by student situation. So if you have a student that traditionally only plays a winter sport and, and won't be playing this year, please reach out to the high school and, and speak to your student guidance counselor or to Mr. Ricks, Ms. Kelly, or Mr. Talbot, and they can work with you on what that looks like. Um, so again, we do have a graduation requirement and a state requirement that students take PE each year. Um, we have a waiver process here that if you participate in any of us, our athletic teams that you're not required to take an in-class PE. Um, but again, it is not just a, a graduation requirement here in Pembroke, but a state requirement. So I know Ms. Mr. Talbot and uh, Ms. Kelly and Mr. Ricks, as well as the guidance staff here are, are ready, willing, and able to work with individual families on that. But I, I would, would say that if there's a spot in your student schedule to take PE, um, it, is, it is important that your student take PE with us if you're not going to play a sport. I think that's all the questions, but let me just run through one more time. Um, just a question around students with lanyards. So anybody with lanyards is allowed to um, spectate at the game. I think what, what has happened is that the bleachers that we have, again, we just have the one set of bleachers, um, doesn't allow for the adequate six feet of social distancing. So there are students or even families with lanyards that are lined up along the fence. Um, I do think what Mr. Talbot was talking about was students that are arriving to watch the contest without a lanyard that are just congregating outside the fence. Um, but I will make sure that he clarifies uh, his expectations with our students prior to Thursday's home um, boys soccer game. All right, that is all I have in there for that. Next in my report is, um, Consideration for first read and approval, which is policy JLCB, inoculation of students. Um, so in your packet, um, there is a draft of policy, of a revised JLCB policy. So policy subcommittee met um, 
not last Thursday, but the Thursday before to discuss this. We've talked a little bit about um, the state regulation at this point that all school age children receive a dose of the seasonal influenza vaccine prior to December 31st. We have been um, pushing out that information to families consistently. Um, again, we did, I think, pause a little bit before we opened our policy because we, there was some movement at the state level and some conversation and a whole host of lawsuits. So we didn't want to change our policy to then go back and revise the policy. Um, but at this point, it looks as though um, the, the, uh, reg the requirement stands and that school age children do need to be vaccina vaccinated with the dose of the seasonal influenza vaccine prior to December 31st. So what you have in your packet is a red line version of our current policy. Um, the edits that we did, um, one is, is more of a uh, revision in the sense that we, we just took, we struck the listing of communicable diseases. I think it defines itself as well as it says that the Department of Public Health updates the list of communicable diseases periodically. So we would just really um, resign ourselves to their list as well as just adding the footnote at the bottom again that says due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has updated the Massachusetts school immunization requirements to include a documented seasonal dose of influenza vaccine. This requirement will remain in effect until rescinded by the governor. So um, we did go back and forth a little bit about this. Um, I don't know, Sue or David, if you want to, to jump in. But I, I think this, what you have here is really um, a, a representation of the sample policy that MASC has put out and that is really what most school districts have adopted for their their policy around inoculation of students. Suzanne, any comments? Or... No, that's exactly what we discussed at policy. Um, you know, I, I think it, yeah, that's exactly what we discussed and we had some, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had, a, I had a thought and then it went and then it came back and I realized it wasn't worth saying so <laughs> sorry it's been a long day <laughs> I just have one question I, you know it says a physician certificate of testing but I know some people will get their flu shot and like stop a shot at the pharmacy mm -hmm. so how, how do we handle that because it's not really a physician there so we uh, similar to our um policy in our athletic handbook around physicals. They, they do give you a printout that says the medication that you've received. So it would just be a copy of that printout. Okay, so the, all of that kind of glumps in yep. a lot of, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to talk about a couple of things logistically. Um, so again, December 31st is the date by which students need to, to be vaccinated and produce proof of vaccination. Um, that is for all students, regardless of the cohort that you're learning in. So even if you're a cohort D student, you would still need to be supplying us with proof of vaccination. Um, again, that seems a, a little bit counterintuitive, but I do wanna remind folks that we do have students that are in cohort D that are participating in high, high school athletics. We do have some cohort D students that do come to our buildings for special ed services at times. So again, the requirement is for all students in the district to be vaccinated by um, 1231. So I just want to reiterate what we're asking for tonight is that you are taking it as a first read and approval because of the timeline. So first, your first action is to waive Natalie, Natalie what's the policy to read? Policy BGB, which is your policy which requires two reads before approval. So you'd first make a motion to waive BGB and then this if that is the, the will of the group. <laughs> Second. Second. Uh, Susie and seconded by Suzanne. Uh, um, Suzanne, your vote? Yes. Susie? Yes. And I'm yes. So it's 3 0. Okay, now would be a motion for consideration of uh, policy JLCB, inoculation of students. I'll take a motion. So moved. By Susie, second. Second. From Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, your vote? Yes. Susie? Yes. And I'm a yes. Perfect. I do just there's a little bit of chatter in the chat box. I do want to also reiterate I know that you all at home can't see the policy. We will post it 
um, to the website tomorrow with, with the updates, but the exemptions for medical and religious exemptions are still allowed under the policy. So there's a couple of folks in here that have some unique um, allergy situations or religious regions. Those exemptions are still allowed under the policy. So it would be the same practice as any other vaccination um, for your students. So again, follow up with your um, the, the nurse in the school that your, your student attends and they can walk you through that. Next, item D of E and F is um, consideration for approval of the revised 2021 school year calendar. Um, so in your packet, you have a copy of our revised school year calendar. Um, what it has on it that was not on the version which you most recently approved back in, I think, uh, end of August, is the dates for our conferences and term dates. Um, so you can see that, that there are term and conference dates listed um, in the right-hand column. It also shows the current last day of school. So there's just one edit here. October 8th should be a no school day. That was the day that we had the weather in town. Um, it had no power, so there was no school that day, which takes our 170th scheduled day to Friday, June 18th. Again, that is obviously subject to change with weather in the winter, but right now our scheduled, our tentative last day of school is Friday, June 18th. I do wanna talk a little bit about the conferences that are listed here um, on the calendar. So again, um, our school year started two years later than it usually starts. So traditionally we have, let's say, elementary conferences the first and second week, first or second week in December. Under the new um, school year start date, we have conferences right before um, winter break. And we recognize that that is not a great time for staff or, or for families, those, those few days right before the holidays to be scheduling a conference. So that's why you see um, those dates are pushed into January. Traditionally, our conferences have been held um, in two windows of time, so a, a 1.30 to 6.30 date, and a 1.30 to 6.30 time slot, and a 4.30 to 8.30 time slot. Again, that is a function of having early release days and having conferences the afternoon of an early release day, as well as a later evening offering for families that aren't able to make it. As you can see from our calendar, we do not have any early release days. Um, again, so this is a shift in our calendar when we start to talk about the remote Mondays and what the ha afternoon half day looks, afternoon half-day remote learning looks like for students. So there are no um, half-day early release days listed on our calendar, which is why the shift for the conferences is four th two nights of 4.30 to 8.30. Um, again, if something changes and we find ourselves back in a, a more traditional school setting, I would anticipate that our spring conferences would look a lot like they have in the past. You can even see on our calendar, we do have um, some early release dates in March. We have not adjusted the to the remote Mondays past those February Mondays. So. Um, we are so hopeful that we are returning to some sort of normalcy at some point, um, but at this, at this moment, the change to conferences is really unique to, to this time, this, this you know, teaching in a, in a COVID-19 pandemic and without having early release days, the, the two options for conferences would be 4.30 to 8.30 on two separate evenings. All, all the conferences are, are remote. Um, will you use a similar sign up? Those of you that have middle school or high school students are familiar with Pick a Time, which is how you have scheduled your conferences in the past. A similar like setup will be available at the elementary levels, but all conferences would be happening remotely. Yes, yes motion to approve. Okay, I need a motion to approve the revised 2020-2021 school year calendar. So moved. I move by Susie. Second. Seconded by Sue. Uh, your vote, Suzanne. Yes. Susie. Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions in the chat box around conferences. So I think it makes more sense to address them as they come in as opposed to at the end. Um, so the first one is, um, would the committee consider adding an early release date of the calendar for conferences? So um, the, the calendar that I have proposed to you does not have an additional early release date to have those afternoon conferences. I think we've heard a lot um, from families around really the value of having the in-person time with, with teachers as well as you know we're overarchingly keeping an eye on time on learning so I'm not recommending taking additional hours away from time on learning um, for, for conferences either at the elementary or the secondary level um, but that doesn't mean you all couldn't suggest an edit to the calendar to have an early release day conference set up if you, you felt the need. 
home. The next, and if there's someone that feels a need, we can put it back on to the, the agenda for December 1st as well. Um, so if you wanna let me know if you feel as though this is an item that you want to add back again for another revision, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, a question around just the state curfew. Um, so again, the state curfew um, is requiring that folks um, be done with public meetings by 9.30 um, and home by 10. So I think with an 8.30 end date to conferences, we, we don't have um, many folks that live an hour and a half away from, from the school building. So at this point, the expectation is that conferences um, from the teacher end are held from within the classroom. Um, will elementary teachers be doing conferences together or will families sign up for a conference with a remote teacher and an in-person teacher? Um, so with, a, with elementary students, I think they're still, again, those dates are in January for elementary conferences. I think they're still um, trying to work through the logistics on, especially our grades that are, have an at-home and an in-person teacher, how the conferences um, will break out for students. Um, so I would expect more information from your, your building specific about that. At the secondary level, our teachers that um, teach our students remotely, we'll also have pick a time schedules for you to plug into. So if you have um, a student that is in edgenuity but takes math and English um, from a Pembroke High School teacher, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for a conference with them as well. You have support teachers where you're not really having to do you don't set up a conference with support No, no, you would just be setting up a conference with those teachers that you have courses at Pembroke High School. There's not, there's not a, a I mean, the support teacher, I, I would, is happy to, to meet with families and, and talk through issues with students, but that's, it's not a traditional conference in the sense that they're not grading all of your students' work. Um, they don't have your student in class and, and that type of piece, so. Question in the chat box on would we look at Monday morning for an offering for conferences? So again, that time is dedicated for teacher planning and collaboration. I haven't, I, we're not asking at this time for teachers to forego their planning or collaboration time in order to house, um, to have conferences. Um, one more question just around why conferences cannot happen until January. So again, if um, once the calendar is posted, you'll see that the secondary conferences are happening um, over the course of I think this, they start this Thursday at the middle school. So the middle school is 11, 19, and 12, 2, or 12, 3, 12, 2. And then the high school is 12, 2, and 12, 10. It's only the elementary conferences that are, are pushed off. Middle school conferences really sync up with the end of the term date. Um, so the term dates um, are, the first term ended today at um, the middle school and the high school, so the conferences are, are aligned with where they have traditionally been in the past. With our elementary students, again, with the two-week change in the start of the school year, the conferences would sync up with aligning with that, first, that week right before winter break, which I, I think is, is a little bit insensitive to ask um, teachers to be, and, and families to be spending um, the, those times doing that. We do recognize that as a tremendously busy time for folks um, so those conferences follow right after the winter break. Next in your packet, you have um, a follow-up to the civil rights monitoring process. I'm gonna throw it over to Jess to talk to you all a little bit about this. So this was a, a civil rights audit that the district had undergone um, back before COVID-19. So Jess, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey everybody. Um, so as you may recall, um, we participated in what's called a tier focused monitoring process. Um, it actually started over two years ago. Um, and that is really an audit of our, both our special education um, processes as well as civil rights. Um, and we, um, as you also may recall, um, fared quite well. So they looked at about over 40 regulations in both special education and civil rights. Um, we were found compliant in um, 40 plus um, as fully implemented. There was one that we were considered as a partially implemented. So that was um, what is called civil rights uh, self-assessment. So we are required um, annually to review basically our processes um, and programming 
for all students um, in regards to our ability to provide equal and equitable access. Um, and so part of that process and kind of action plans that we've been doing and putting together, and we're just about at the end of that, is the last piece is about surveying. So the Department of Ed put together templates um, in regards to different stakeholders to gather information. And um, the one that I'm coming to you with is really the family survey. So I would ask that, um, that you look at that for approval um, to put out to families. I don't know if you have any questions about it. Um, as I said, DESI, it's really a DESI template um, as well as we vetted that through our social justice working group as well um, to look at it and ask um, and add any questions as well. So we're looking um, over the next couple weeks to send that out. Um, we haven't decided on a specific date, kind of working around the holiday as well. Some questions can be done electronically, like the other service that we sent out. Correct. So we'll be working with Sharon um, to put together this um, in more of probably a Google form um, for families to fill out so that we can gather the data um, and use it um, to look at trends, etc. Thank you. Sure. All right. So I have to get a motion to put out our civil rights monitoring process family survey. I have a motion. So moved. From Susie. Second. Second from Sue. Um, Sue, how do you vote? Yes. Susie? Yes. And I'm a yes. Perfect. Um, there's not any questions in the chat box about the survey. There is a question just around kind of the demographics of our staff here in Pembroke. So you can find that on the DESE website. If you have a hard time locating that, please reach out to Mary Beth, Jess, or myself, and we can share um, the links with you all on how to figure out what the diversity of our staff is here in Pembroke. One more thing? I think I have one more thing. Uh, so the last thing in my report is the discussion of preschool fees. So back when we changed, um, well, back when we landed on our hybrid model, we did adjust our traditional preschool fee um, to align with the fact that students were not in person with us four days a week. But now that we have shifted back to four days of in-person learning for our um, youngest learners in, in preschool, I would recommend that you go back to the fee. So you'll remember when we first started discussing the preschool fee, it was my recommendation that we take it in three um, different payment options in case we needed to adjust so that we weren't in the position as we were in the spring where we were issuing refunds to a whole host of, of folks. So um, the second payment for preschool is um, a 12-1 due date. So I have, um, I will share this slide, I think. I think I can share the slide, um, but it is also in your packet, but I'll share it so that folks at home can see um, the PowerPoint slide as well. Just give me one second. Um, so our <clears throat> traditional preschool fee for our half day program, so again, we do run two types of preschool here in, in Pembroke, our um, integrated preschool, which is a half day offering for our peers um, at $2,200. Those That class meets Tuesday through Friday, either a.m. or p.m., um, depending upon your student. And then we have our second model of preschool, which is a full, um, full day five days of preschool. So the, the fees traditionally associated with that are $2,200 for our half day model and $5,500 for our full day model. Um, we did talk about reducing the fee 
um, for our first payment. So we were at $500 for our um, half day model. So that would have been an annual fee of $1,500 if we had stayed in the um, two day hybrid model for the, the, the remainder of the school year. What I'm recommending is that payment two and payment three be $700. This reflects four half day in person days for those students. Um, so that takes the annual fee to 1900. You see it's still um, less than what the, the original voted on fee was because we did have that period at the beginning of the year where folks were, um, where students were only here two days a week. Um, similar for the full day fee, um, we had originally, um, you all voted on 1250 being the payment for the hybrid model. So that would have been um, $3,750 for the year. You can see my recommendation is that payment two and payment three would be $1,825, which brings the annual fee for the full day preschool to $4,900. Again, if there is some sort of shift to our learning model, we have the opportunity again to adjust before payment three is due um, so that we're not in a place, as I said, where we're having to issue a whole host of refunds for folks. Aaron, does this also um, cover the, the shortened year? You know, 180 days to yep. So our preschool generally doesn't start um, on the first day of, of school for regular students or end on the last day of school for our um, for regular students as well. It is already an abbreviated year, but the year um, this year is very similar to what it has been in years past. Thank you. Susan, any questions? No, seems fair and reasonable and makes sense. Thank you, Susie. No questions. Thank you. Oh, and I have my question answered. Do you have to take this as a motion? You do have to take it as a vote to um, revise the preschool fee. Okay, we have to take this as a motion uh, to revise the preschool fee. Uh, I will take a motion. So moved. From Susie. Second. Second from Sue. Sue, how do you vote? Yes. Susie. Yes. And I'm a yes. Perfect. The last thing um, on the agenda is the future meeting dates and topics. So again, following your traditional schedule, the, the meeting dates in December would be December 1st and December 15th, 12-1 and 12-15. Um, I think you all talked about keeping those at the last meeting. But I did just want to give a little bit of foreshadowing shadowing on some of the future topics. So I did talk a little bit about, again, having Lisa join us on December 1st as well as having Brian here um, to share kind of the latest and greatest as far as the, the winter sports, as I would expect, similar to the conversation we had in the fall that you all will wanna see the sports specific modifications, make sure it's something that we can, um, you know, commit to being able to do with our facilities and with our programs before making a decision to participate. I also wanted to share um, some of the survey information. So various surveys have been happening um, here over the past couple of weeks. We did survey elementary families just around kind of um, what their feelings and, and experiences were with our hybrid model at the elementary level. We had gotten a little bit of anecdotal feedback um, from kind of both camps that it, it wasn't enough. Those of you that were able to hear um, Mr. Kelly in the audience tonight, he did um, share some disappointment with what the at-home days look like for his hybrid students. We've also heard from other families that the at-home days are too much screen time for families. So we surveyed families to kind of get a feel for whether we're providing too much, too little, or just enough. So I will share some of that feedback with you on December 1st. We also have a group of students here at the high school. So the executive board um, here at the high school did um, have a student survey over the past week and a half, um, just kind of getting students feelings. So we've heard from parents, we've heard from administrators. Um, last week we had the opportunity to hear from teachers at the high school, um, but I, I wanna give you an opportunity to hear from, from students as well. So members of the e-board will be joining us on December 1st to share some of those survey results with you as well. So, um, you know, we also have been collecting some staff information um, just around support in the hybrid model, what we could, could do to support teachers better, more effectively, more efficiently. Um, so you know, my, my hope is to bring all three of those kind of surveys together and, and, and share some overarching themes and, and trends that we're seeing both with students, families, um, and staff. So that is on um, my agenda for the 12-1 meeting. With that being said, I will take a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, voting down the line, Suzanne. Yes. 
Susie? Yes. And I'm a yes. Everyone stay safe. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Please play it safe, and we'll see you back here for December 1st. Thank you. Good.